I'm Tom Thwomby, Professor of Economics at SMU and Director of the Richard B. Johnson Center of Economic Studies. We're here at the Advances in Econometrics Conference. This is the 12th conference. Uh, the topic of the conference is Vector Autoregressive Models, New Developments and Applications. Uh, when we say vector autoregressions, we have to the right uh, Professor Christopher Sims who is professor of economics at Princeton and really came up with the notion of vector autoregressions. Uh, he did win the Nobel Prize along with Thomas Sargent in 2011 for macroeconometric modeling and the cause and effect in our macroeconomy. So uh, Chris, it's very nice of you to volunteer to uh, answer some questions that we have come up with and we'll certainly be interested in uh, what your answers are going to be. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you an it. easy one first. It's okay. just sort of a lob into your wheelhouse here. Uh, when you first started working on VAR models, had you any inkling that VAR models would come to dominate empirical macro econometrics? Did they? <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they came to be uh, popular, but I thought it was a very good idea. Um, so. Um, I certainly wasn't surprised that other people used it. Um, there were other people who had done very closely related things. I, I got the idea from uh, uh, Ned Nadiri and Sherwin Rosen who had a paper on factor demand models. They did multivariate factor demand models and displayed and discussed the results using impulse responses although they didn't call them that. And I realized that approach was more widely applicable. So um, how long did it take for you to get your paper published in Econometrica? That's always a common question we ask of uh, Nobel Prize winners. Given that we know that a few Nobel Prize winning ideas have been uh, rejected by Econometrica, was yours rejected first and then accepted later or not? Uh, <laughs> the one where I did VAR is macroeconomics and reality was com a commission paper. It was the Fisher Schultz lecture um, at uh, the European meetings of the Econometric Society. So it was more or less certain that it was going to be published. Before that, I had a paper on time aggregation um, that was published. Uh, I can't remember who the editor was. I had two referee reports, one of whom said there was nothing new in it and the other one said it was a pretty good paper and the editor picked the more positive referee. Uh, but it could easily have gone the other way. <clears throat> well, you um, were an undergraduate in mathematics uh, at Harvard and I would just like to know really what sort of turned you on to economics. How did you go from mathematics into economics? Well, I had been, um, um, I, I, my grandfather was an economist. Um, I talk a little bit about, about this in my autobiographical ex essay on the Nobel site. But my grandfather um, always used to greet me and his other grandchildren when we would come in and see him. He would say, well, Chris, what do you think of the present situation of the country when I was eight years old? <laughs> <laughs> and I never knew what to say, but I got the idea that this was a question one ought to have an answer to. <laughs> um, and I had an uncle who uh, was a labor economist, Mark Lyserson, and um, he used to uh, not just try to persuade me, he used to try to kind of hypnotize me into being an economist by saying I would become an economist. Um, and I always thought he was basically uh, being co counterproductive for his own aims because I was so annoyed at him. But then I was a math major and I was thinking of going to graduate school in mathematics, but mathematics by itself so it seemed doing that abstract stuff all my life didn't seem that attractive. And so about... Uh, couple months into my senior year, I decided to apply to 
econ graduate school. <coughs> and I had already taken a couple of ec economics courses because I, ki I kind of knew that this was an alternative. But it's probably true that I wouldn't have thought of economics as the main alternative if it weren't for my relatives. I also had friends who were economics, who were math majors, who were thinking of economics. And we used to sit around and talk about how trivial and, um, and um, charlatanish uh, much of the mathematics we saw in economics was. And my friend just thought it was too disgusting to get, make oneself a part of. And my view was I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to write bad papers. <laughs> and that what economists did was important. So. Well, let me uh, take on the role of your grandfather, if that's all right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to ask you a question about the conditions of the economy. <laughs> so uh, well, I, I'm sure this is coming from some other place above, mm -hmm. right, uh, down to you right now. So given the dramatic expansion of the Fed's balance sheet as a result of the Fed's initial response to the financial crisis and its subsequent policy of quantitative easing, do you see a danger of a burst of inflation in the future? <laughs> I do see a danger of a burst of inflation, but not from those actions of the Fed really at all. Um, the people who think that the Fed's actions have created infla an inflation risk um, still are thinking in terms of money and money multipliers. Uh, and that's just an obsolete conceptual framework. Once once the Fed is paying interest on its reserve balances at l levels that are similar to Treasury bill rates, and right now they're higher than Treasury bill inter interest rates, uh, the distinction between money and government, interest-bearing government debt is gone. The Fed, by taking reserve deposits, is issuing government debt. And what matters is the, the total government debt. Uh, and then, to some extent, the transactions value of various kinds of dumber government debt, but treasury bills are arguably as good as, as reserve deposits as uh, uh, for many kinds of transactions. So I don't think the monetarist framework helps us here. Uh, the Fed, by raising interest rates on reserve balances, can make them as attractive as it likes. And it got the right to do this at the same time as the TARP legislation was passed. So if inflation were to break out, the Fed can raise interest rates, and that would be very powerful, no matter what the size of its balance sheet. Um, so the reason, when I talk to people like Alan Meltzer, he'll say, what, but the Fed might not raise interest rates. Um, well, that's always true. Raising interest rates is always politically unpopular, and the size of the Fed's balance sheet won't make it less or more politically unpopular. There's always a worry about whether the Fed is independent enough and firm enough to raise interest rates when it's necessary. Uh, but that's not new and has nothing to do with the balance sheet. The real worry is that um, with the level of outstanding marketable debt, um, the l interest rates are so low now that interest payments as a proportion of the budget, the US government federal budget, is not any bigger, really, than it has been historically. It's under 10%, and it's varied. It went up in the early 80s with the, in the wake of the big deficits in the 70s and 80s. It went up to 20% briefly, and that's when Congress finally got its act together and put in some mechanisms to control the debt, and it's come down. But now it's down back to below 10%. But that's only because interest rates are practically zero. And the debt outstanding is very large. If interest rates went back up to 5%, the proportion of the develop, uh, budget that would be taken up with interest expense would be at an unprecedented level. It would be 30% or more. Um, and we don't know how Congress will react to that. If, if the Fed felt that it had to, in order to cut off inflation, raise interest rates quickly to 5%, and Congress suddenly discovered that the deficit had blown up because of what the Fed was doing. It would be quite clear that that's what was going on. You, would you get um, political interference with the Fed? 
uh, I think it's very hard to predict. Uh, one hopes that the reaction would be what it was in the late 80s, or, and they would see that, because it's not, once you see that if they, you don't raise taxes, the debt is going to grow, that'll make the interest expense bigger the next period, that'll make the problem, you, you can see the exponential growth in the problem. I think that would, I'm hoping that, as in the past, Congress would finally get it and uh, react. But that's the danger, that we get to a point which has been there in Latin American countries, some other high inflation countries, where, where the Fed realizes that there is no re response from Congress. Interest rate rises are just going to pass through to increased rates of issue of government debt, and then the Fed might hesitate uh, because it, it raising interest rates would no longer have any restrictive effect on inflation. It's, it's not they would hesitate because of worrying uh, about some political reaction. They'd hesitate because they would realize it would actually make things worse, not better, to raise interest rates if there were no response from, mm -hmm. the, from the Congress. So you think that uh, at some point in time, the fiscal policy side of our uh, economy will bring us back in line in terms of a reasonable debt to GDP ratio, or how do you foresee uh, fiscal policy going in the future? Um, it, um, <laughs> budget constraints are satisfied one way or another, so <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, I think it it's, uh, will, if economic growth, when economic growth picks up again, um, revenues will start to rise. Um, I hope we s can get away from this rhetoric that we can cut taxes while handling the budget deficit. Uh, seems to me no realistic economic policy person can should be arguing that we can cut taxes now. We We've got an aging, we've got a lot of debt, we've got an aging population, rising medical costs. Uh, we're going to have to raise taxes. Um, well, there'll be cuts in expenditures too. I hope at some point there has to be a consensus that that's, that's what has to be done. And then um, if you just look at the percentage adjustment in the debt and tax levels that are required to handle the debt, it's completely feasible. It's only because people talk as if raising taxes is impossible. But other countries have much higher tax rates than we do, and we could go just part way there and everything would be great. So I, it, it has to get resolved. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move uh, to another question that I'm sure your grandfather would raise, and that's about the European Union. Uh, are there uh, really lessons that we can garner from the European Union experience that would guide the United States economy in a way to avoid some of the problems that we've seen at, in the European Union? Yes, don't go back on the gold standard. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson number one, right? <laughs> Essentially, what, what, what Europe has done is create a situation where each country in Europe faces the same kinds of constraints that countries on the gold standard do. And that's what cre what's created all these problems. And um, the UK and the US and Japan, which all have worse 